You ready? Okay. Okay, so we're ready for our second presentation for the afternoon. And uh, from a well-known researcher and a good friend of mine, Jose Fernandez, he's going to present about uh, some current malware packing trends. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So this work was done uh, by Joan Calvet when he was a graduate student with me. He finished his PhD in 2013. And he built a tool and a methodology for looking at uh, packers, not, from, not so much from a how to unpack it, how to get around the protection, but to, to the, the motivation of the work was to try to understand the different ways in which uh, packers are working, or at least in the malware world, uh, and whether there are any trends or that we could detect. So he built this tool uh, that I called Wave Atlas, uh, or like the movie that came at the time, Cloud Atlas. The notion of wave here is waves of, of, of uh, unpacking. So how to make a cartography, if you wish, of how the unpacking happens. So um, we, we did some more recent experiments with it. We did uh, ex explore quite a few uh, malware samples. We did this in 2014 and 15. Fanny, who is here in the audience, Francois and Erwan helped with experimental setup. And Jean-Yves is, the, I guess, the co-inventor. He was a director of um, Joan during his thesis. So what we're going to present is um, the question. Why are we looking at this? Uh, what, uh, why, why we think it's important? Um, how we went about to answer the question of how is malware uh, being unpacked? And finally, uh, we'll discuss the results, what we saw, and some of the in the conclusion, we'll see uh, some of the limitations of the work and also what we're, where we think we can take this forward. So, a packer, you know, I'm a professor, I cannot start a talk without giving a definition. <laughs> so what do we mean by packer here? We mean uh, a, tr a, program tr a program transformation where the output is a program that will de decrypt or decompress a part of, the, of, of, of its original code. So, um, there are a lot of techniques that are being used for packing or for unpacking, uh, and, they are, they are, and, and there's um, different tools, but what we want to know is, independently of the tool, is there a, a generic pattern, a model of how malware in particular, and we're not talking about a DRM here, malware in particular is being packed or is being unpacked. So why does it matter? It matters because if we can find some common features of, that are tool independent, that are family independent, uh, that are group of malware author independent, then we can have a better understanding of the unpacking process and maybe we can devise better defenses for either reversing or detecting. Uh, more importantly, I think, uh, what I think is interesting is the differences. Different tools will unpack differently, up to what point? Different groups, different ma crime, uh, crime families or, 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 or malware families and also potentially different authors might um, have different patterns. And this is interesting from the point of view of attribution and also um, classification. So if you look at other work in the, in the field, mostly it falls into two, two categories. Uh, you've got tools like uh, PEID that uh, gives you some identification of what Packer tool was used, uh, but it does not tell you much about how the unpacking is happening for that particular sample. Um, and, and, and of course, and in particular, it gives you no idea about what is going on, what are the patterns of unpacking um, when it's an unknown packer, when you cannot detect what packer it's, be, it's being used. Um, also, there are uh, a few papers and a few presentations about um, describing the inner workings of uh, particular packers, but there isn't really much work in terms of a global picture of packers in the malware world, so we, which is why we wanted to do that. So what do we mean by a packer model? Um, here's where we have the notion of wave. If you wish, when you start with a packed file, that is wave number zero. Every piece of code that is being generated or written by this a file is then wave one. The code in wave one then is going to unpack some more files, or sorry, sorry, some more uh, code, and that code that is being unpacked in wave one is wave two, and so forth. So if you wish of the final payload or the final code, uh, in the end you will have bits of code that are in the original 
untouched, wave one, wave zero, then wave one, wave two, up to n. And the model that we hypothesize is that the payload of the malware is going to be at the end, in the last bit that was unpacked, okay? Why do we thought this was a reasonable model? We thought, we, th we thought so because here the objective of, of, of uh, this packing is to protect the logic of the, the malware, the payload. Um, what is the alternative? What is the other counter, uh, counter hypothesis that we're putting aside is that the actual payload could be um, split along the waves, right? You could have some of the payload that is actually was untouched, it's in, in, the code, in wave zero, and some more functions are in code wave two, three, four, and then maybe a little bit at the end. But the hypothesis or intuition was that it was all towards the end um, in, the last, in the last wave. So how do we prove this? So we build a tool to do the analysis called Wave Atlas, and we did um, some experiments, so field study use, using malware. So the sample selection problem, how do we address it in our case? So the first thing is that we cannot, of course, analyze all malware. So therefore, there's going to be some bias in the experiment, and we have to accept that. It's not, uh, it's the result that you're going to see is about a certain subset of malware. Um, also, we wanted to focus, and this is funny because I just listened to Holly Stock on the other room. We wanted to focus on prevalent malware, uh, and we wanted to focus on successful families in particular, because here the idea is that those that pack better probably are more successful, where we wanted to see the sophisticated ones. The antiviruses, so what do we use? We use the antivirus rankings. Um, in order to measure how successful a malware was, we used two indicators, um, how, 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 how talked about the, ma the malware was on, in academic and industry research and, um, um, and other uh, things like, um, you know, were there, were there any takedown attempts. In the end, we selected these six families that most of you know about, and then for each of these families, we, we selected 100 uh, samples, at least 100 samples, as a matter of fact, more than 100. Um, and of course, all, each of these samples being different, having been packed differently. The experimental setup with, that we had is the following. Essentially, we ran the malware and virtual health machines in what we call the analyzers, and we let them run for about 20 minutes with uh, the objective of generating a trace. A lot of these malware has callbacks, so therefore we had a uh, sister or brother uh, isolator machine that was essentially providing a network emulation and uh, providing some request, uh, response to network requests. And the whole thing was uh, run by a controller that was essentially scheduling the virus experiments and also tracking which experiments failed or not. The important notion here is that not all runs were successful. So what was the criteria for determining that, in, that uh, when, uh, an, uh, a run was successful is when the trace had more than 500 instructions. And of course, it doesn't work sometimes because either the malware detects virtualization or detects that it's not, it's in a lab environment because of callbacks, or sometimes it happens, you know, the, the, the sample is corrupted. What about the results? First question is, of, of all of these software that we saw, how much packed it was? How deep did this process of successful waves of packing or, or unpacking? It was, and here you have the graph. It tells you that um, the percentage uh, of samples um, that, um, that for which there was code in only in, in, in a certain wave. So for example, only 1.72%, 72%, a very small number of, um, of this malware was only having one wave. By the way, the fact that it, 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 so that means that it wasn't packed at all, right? Actually, correction, it was packed, but it was only one, uh, uh, one iteration through the packing process. Most of it, as you can see, had at least two to five different num waves. So relatively sophisticated. Uh, in terms of how, how much iterations there are through the packing process. In addition to just 
characterize how, much, how many waves there were. We wanted to know, of course, whether um, the, the payload was in the first wave, or sorry, in the last wave, uh, or, or in the intermediate ones. In our case, of course, n is equal to five or six at most. So what, what uh, criteria did we use to determine whether the code in those ways was actually the payload? The first one was to see whether there were, and there's several criteria, I'm just gonna describe a few in the talk. The first one was how exotic the machine code was in it. So one of the measures of exoticness is really to look at the mnemonics of the machine code. If you um, look at the mnemonics, what we did is um, we essentially took Notepad, I think, or calculator, calc.exe, as a, um, and the mnemonics in it, as the, the subset of normal or uh, mnemonics that you would find in a non-malicious, um, and, and there were about 80 of those um, in a non-malicious program. And then we, we took those as a baseline of saying, okay, how many mnemonics that are non-standard exist in wave one, two, three, and four? And then, um, you know, in, in, in how, if there were more than 10. So the result is that the first code wave is the only one that really has a substantial or uh, a substantial and significant number of non-classical mnemonics. Uh, non-classical mnemonics being, of course, one way to obfuscate, one way to uh, thwart the, uh, the, the, the reverser. So all of these sort of throwing um, nails in the road of the reverser were only present in the first wave. Another, another um, telltale sign is the use of unconventional, or the unconventional use of the call, the call mnemonic. So the call mnemonic normally in normal programs is for calling a subroutine or a function, and it ends with a return or, or ret going back to the next instruction. In malware, uh, for obfuscation purposes, call is used often uh, just to jump around in the program without ret instructions, just to obfuscate uh, these assemblers and so forth. So, how many, so we counted in each wave how many of the calls were unconventional, not, follow, not followed by a ret. And this we can do, of course, because we have the dynamic trace. And the use of call in a non-standard fashion without returns, i.e. from non-compiled code, was only prevalent in the first wave, okay? So, I'm, I'm stating the obvious in a very scientific fashion, right? The first wave, which is essentially the, the packed code, is where all of the protection is, most of the protection is. Another, another uh, telltale sign is whether um, there is any system modification. Now, this is a telltale sign not of protection, but a telltale sign of the malware is actually doing something. So it's probably the payload. So what is this something? Well, it's, it's, it's either uh, m modifying registry entries or uh, calling uh, network system functions um, and, and so forth, this access functions and so forth. So what we discovered is that all of that, all of those telltale signs of network, uh, of network activity and of payload activity is all, almost all, in the last wave, okay? Thus confirming the obvious that the payload is in the last wave. Um, there's a whole lot more things that we looked at. I don't want to spend too much time on these details, but um, yeah, I, I encourage you to look at the paper for, for more details on those. So I guess the first, the first thing from all of this is where we're right. Is the model correct? Um, in as much as we were able to validate it on those samples, the answer is yes. In particular, the first code waves uh, do not have any useful payload in it. All they have is uh, essentially packing or unpacking. They do not interact with the system, and they are quite aggressive in that, in, in terms of protection. They, 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 use, they do use exotic instructions, bad calls, and uh, also except, exception throwing. We, what's one of the things that it's in the paper, I didn't talk about it, is how much Except exception throwing there was in the, in, in the waves, because that is also a way in which you can um, 
handle uh, a flow within the program in a way that is very hard for these assemblers to detect. And all of the activity um, seems to be in the last code wave, and that's the one that interacts with the system. And the fact that we do not see any these obfuscation, uh, obfuscation primitive signs that we like uh, exception throwing and call conventions also leads us to believe that the, that the code in the last wave is actually regular compiled code, which is consistent with what we know about malware authors. And some interesting, there's always some wow moments, and it's always great because you, know, you start with an hypothesis, and the hypothesis comes from what? From what you, you guys know, from the folklore, right? Is, is what we think is the truth. And then you do some experiments, and then you say, yes, I was right. But what, when it re really becomes interesting, is like, I was right, but. <laughs> but what? What is the but? The but here is that what we discovered is that the, it's not always the last wave that it contains the payload. And a lot of the samples, a uh, good chunk of them, it was the one before the last. OK, so, oh, that's interesting. Why the one before the last? So we looked at the code of the last wave, and mostly it contains um, hooks that are put in place by the, by the malware. So, it's, it's, so these hooks, uh, or these hooked functions um, that are going to be hooked through interrupts, the code for them is actually written out of the last wave, which is the payload. Okay? And, and, and then bec because of our, our tool detects that these areas of memory are being written by the payload, they are con these uh, areas of memory, these hooked functions, are the last <coughs> wave as per definition. So the hypothesis is almost validated. It's the payload is always in the last wave, except when it's in the last, the one before the last. Okay. Uh, and that's about, uh, that was only one, one uh, family, I believe. So in conclusion, um, we have painfully proven what for you is probably the obvious, which is um, the way that malware is being packed um, is by having as much anti-reversing in the first wave of code, in the packed code. And after that, the successful wave of unpacking are just there to provide extra protection. And the nuggets, the payload, is at the end of that process in the last, um, the last wave of, 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 of packing. So, and by the way, uh, I guess no better measure than before. How many waves? Well, it's between two and five, okay, for most of the malware. And you've seen it's, it's about the same. It's 20% for two, three, four, and five. And never more than six. So the first question that we can ask ourselves is why are not malware authors doing, uh, why are they putting it all at the end? It, it sort of makes it obvious, right? Because in some sense, it makes it easy for us. You let the machine run until the end. And you sort of, and then if you, as, as a, it's probably a very inefficient way to unpack, but um, you could let it run for 20 minutes like we did. Um, and, and then you just look at the, the trace, you look at the various parts of the memory. Uh, our tool will label which parts of the memory correspond to which wave. And then, okay, I just need to concentrate on the last wave because that's the one that I know by my hypothesis contains the nuggets. I don't even have to reverse the rest. It's just going to be unpacking code. So in some sense, this, the fact that this model, this truth, makes it easier for reversers. So why are they not sort of spreading the payload across the various waves, which would make it harder in some sense because it would force the reverser to look at all of the wave code, uh, or all of the code in each of the waves to see to sort of try to reassemble the, the full logic of the program. Um, so maybe next year in VB, somebody will use our tool and show that they found some malware that does this. And I think I was talking with somebody yesterday. I can't remember the name. I can't remember who it was. It was after, it was after 3 o'clock in the morning who mentioned that there was at least one man malware sample in which he had seen that. But it's, from what we've seen, it's not a, a prevalent model. And, um, and the question, which is open-ended, which is, okay, now we know a bit better how the unpacking model or, or the trend is. 
how useful is this? Um, can we, does it allow us to develop better reversing tool? Does it allow us to think of potentially having some nice behavioral rules uh, that we didn't think of previously in terms of, uh, of, of, of detecting um, the malware? And then of course the last question is, uh, we've only looked at six um, malware families. Uh, albeit we were careful in selecting ones that we thought were significant because of their prevalence. Uh, but um, but uh, obviously um, this is a question that would need probably more research. We like to say that in academia, more research is needed. Um, here the, the, the research is essentially, uh, could we do this at large? And, I, and, and um, at large with, you know, sh sh actually what I will even suggest here um, is that, uh, well, we are going to make the tool available uh, open source. Um, and it would be nice that uh, all of you who work with AV companies, as you are going through the process of maybe analyzing some of these malware, that you maybe just run the tool on a couple of samples and sort of that becomes part of your business process in which you say, okay, well, this malware sample has seven waves or 10 waves. Oh, this is unusual. It's more than before. So that allows us to, I hope that will give you some, some extra things to look at that are not too expensive to look at that might give you some hints on how different, especially those of you who are doing malware research, how different these samples that we're encountering are. And, uh, and if you do so, please, please let us know that you're using the tool and let us know uh, whether what you find is different from what we did uh, find in our study. And that pretty much is the end. So, did anyone have any questions for Hussai? So, I have a question, Jose. Uh, one of, the, one of, the, the, um, one of the things is with when, uh, when you look inside the packing, when you, when you say there are different waves of packers, but the on, only in the first case, uh, is the really these really heavy of obfuscation techniques used? What is the, what are the what, what are those other waves really doing apart from just adding time? Well, it's a good question. Um, it's probably just that. It's probably just adding time, right? It's probably actually I'm guessing that um, it's probably adding time because a lot of the a lot of the AVI products and not all of them use. Um, um, use uh, uh, sandboxing online to fool the code and to start doing, fool the malware and to start doing the things that are telltale signs, uh, which are in the payload. So I'm guessing that these deobfuscation waves are just probably just to delay. Um, also, I think the other, the other thing is that if you are reversing the code and you are doing it you know, by hand with a ladybug or either pro, um, but you, you, you actually have to find the place where the next wave is being, you know, the loop that is generating the next one. And then, okay, so then you will run it until, until you find that first wave. And then you have to sort of reverse that, first, that second wave to find the point where the third one is being generated and so forth. So it's also adding time in terms of uh, a reversing time. So I think that's the reason why there is, there is so many waves, but you... you um, it's to slow down the reversing, whether it's being done online in the sandboxing and by manually by the reverser. But and did you find any um, particular markers that were different between, say, malware that has two waves and well that has six waves? Is there different markers in there that would indicate that that was going to happen beforehand or not? Uh, no, no. What what was surprising though is that the number of waves was not consistent across a family. So um, what we didn't go into the details of, what that suggests is that these samples were not packed. Um, so th there might be some randomness in how the packer is generating uh, the, the packed version because the wave, the, the, the wave number was not consistent. Or uh, the malware authors could be different switching, switching packing families, or pa sorry, switching packers uh, during the lifetime of the, the malware. But we didn't do the deep, the deep analysis of seeing within a family uh, when was a sample captured and how did wave uh, numbers uh, evolve over time, things like that. We didn't do. That would be the next step. Mm -hmm. 
Were there any other questions? Uh, yeah, just uh, over here. Over there. Uh, sorry if it was said and I just missed it, but uh, how do you uh, say that one wave has just ended and another started? Were you just looking at a specific piece of code and whenever the particular instruction has changed, it's another wave or? Yes, so, so the, details, the details of that are actually not in the paper. It's in another academic paper that we're just publishing in, uh, in, a, in CCS, an academic conference. But there is a recursive definition. The recursive definition is that it's by looking at the memory, okay? So you have a, a memory, you have a, a file that is in memory, and by default, uh, everything in there gets labeled as wave zero, okay? Whenever a program writes into a memory location, um, whenever code in a wave in, that has been labeled zero writes into a memory location, that memory location gets labeled as one, okay? Then whenever code that has a label one writes onto another part of memory, that, has, that is being labeled as being two, okay? So whenever code that has a label n writes something, whatever that it writes is being labeled as n plus one. In the end, your memory will, will have different labels, okay? And, and then we just um, look at these, as being the waves, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mathematical definition, but it's also a shortcut because it, 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 pre it, it uh, prevents us from having to actually semantically go through the code and see what w each wave is, okay? And in, in, in the coin side. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? Okay, with that, I'd like to thank Jose for his presentation. Thanks.